if you have looked at the bulletin and checked out the sermon title, before you, the grammar police, uh, uh, before all of you call my English teacher telling her how much she has failed society, I want you to just hang a little bit. So please, I ask you to just bear with me, hear me out, since I believe that there is a message from the Lord still in here. We have become a polarized society, so much so, that the Scientific American Organizations um, posted an article with the headline, Today's Biggest Threat, The Polarized Mind. Let me just read a few sentences from this article. Quote, as a bitter strife between left and right, citizens and non-citizens, white and not white and non-white, attest the greatest threat to humanity today. It goes beyond political and religious divides, economics and psychiatric diagnosis. It goes beyond cultural conflicts and even the degradation of the environment. And yet all of that is included. As psychologists concerned with the social and psychological basis of human destructiveness, and as dedicated observers of history, we have arrived at the conclusion that so much of what we call human depravity or evil seem to be based on the principle termed the polarized mind. The polarized mind is the fixation on a single point, point of view, to the utter exclusion of competing points of other views. And it has caused more human torment and misery than virtually any other factor, unquote. Today's society has become so focused and firm in what is our own points or in our perspective that we no longer listen to others. If you will notice, there are even more and more options when purchasing your morning beverage. Have you noticed that? It used to be just you order one thing and it's the same drink for everybody. Now, you walk in and sometimes when I meet with church Church folks or church leaders, I say, okay, bring me, surprise me at a place we've never been before. And as I walk in, I was like, what do you order here? Like there's boards and boards of options. And some of them even have digital boards that you wait a few minutes before it flips to more options. Why? It's because we all have come into this place in society where I will get what I want. I will get how I want it. And I will get it the way it has to be by my own perspective. There are more and more options even of how muffins are made. Muffins. There's where the topping is at the top or topping in the middle. There's even muffins where it's, it's, it's baked a certain way. It's shaped differently and eaten a different way. Have you noticed this? Are we living in a society where there's just so much variety because everybody just wants their own way, their own thing, the way they want it and how they want it? It's because what I want is what I want. I don't care what others think or what others have to say about it. Then the rise of social media in the rest recent decades topped by the global lockdown where we've become so dependent on online and virtual communication, we've become so good at unfriending or even blocking people who do not have the same political views, the same likes, the same perspectives, and the same experience that we want for our own. We've gotten so good at avoiding folks who have different opinions, experiences, and perspectives, even in life-threatening situations like COVID, pandemic, masks, vaccines, natural remedies, and all sorts. Then even deeper, you get religious beliefs and backgrounds, and when someone else do not believe the same way we do, we don't even ask them to stop, pause, or say, say no more. Same as shut up, really. We just unfollow them. We just block them, unfriend them, or hang up on the phone before they could even finish. We even take Highway 212 instead of 169 to make sure that we avoid seeing this folk on the road. We even go to two more miles or two more different townships to shop at a different target to avoid coming across somebody we know at this target. We've become a society where we've chosen 
only our own preferences and could care less about what the rest of the world really has to say about it. And something that I've heard, people who try to support these who are frustrated with having so many of those who oppose them, the narrative and the, and the, the different perspectives is, hey, it's okay, you do you. Have you heard that phrase before? Don't worry about it, just do you. You'll be all right. You want to do your thing? You do you. As if, if we choose to do you, that the rest of the world doesn't really matter. But I propose to you today that that is not how Christians ought to live. I propose to you today that as people who claim to be children of God, that is not the way we operate and live by. It is not the norm of this world. You do you is what the world recommends. You want your own sanity? Forget all these people. You do your thing, brother. You do you. Don't worry about everybody else. The fact exists that when we are unchecked, unbalanced, and not held to accountability or ill-informed, the checks and balances have no longer been the way that guides us in our way of life. We've unfriended, unfollowed, and shut down the rest of the world. Because you know what? I was told, you do you. Again, as children of God, as Christians, I believe that this you do you is not where God wants us to operate under. In fact, you ready for this? You do we. Anything you do ought to be we do this. Any actions that you do ought to be coming from we all are part of this. It's not a you do you. That's the world. As Christians, we ought to come from the same place and that is the place of God. The world says, you do your own thing. But as Christians, we are called to come from a place of a heart of Jesus. Here's what I mean. You do you emphasizes on establishing and doing only what is best for you. If this is what makes you happy, if this is what gets you to succeed, if this is what gets you to recognize, if this is what gets you this, that, and the other, you do you. But you do we is a total opposite. When you do anything and you do it for other people because you represent God. So you say, okay, easier said than done, but how do you do we? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you came to church. I'm glad you're so involved in this, that you're really asking. Because I have an answer for you, even if you don't really want it. Here's how you do we. And I bring you to the passage um, of focus uh, in today's message, which is found in some chapter 100 verse 1 and 2. Psalm 100 is, is a short chapter. It's only five verses. And today we're even keeping that short, you know, keeping the short theme. <laughs> Some got it. And in verse 1 and 2, there are a few things that we're asked to do in order for us to be. Check it out. It starts with, shout to the Lord all the earth. To those of you who continue to think that I'm really loud, and I can even hear it right now, it, 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 the Bible says, shout to the Lord. I don't know. And then it goes by saying, serve the Lord with joy. Ah, we forget that last part so many times in our service. See, we even do an accounting, well, I've served this, I've done this, I've served, I've done that, but we forget that that service ought to come from the Lord with joy. Have you been challenged in your place of serving lately? Have you been challenged in the lack of joy in your service lately? And then it finishes by saying, come before him with singing thanksgiving. When was the last time in our difficult situations, in our challenges, that we still sang out loud in thanksgiving? And if this you, like me, then perhaps here's a time where we can refocus where our shout, where our serve, and where we coming into God in singing ought to be really in our hearts. I propose that when we do all these things, we shift from being focused on our individual self to realizing we are all part of God's love. We all become one. So when people decide to heed the advice of you do you, it is supposedly to keep them happy, sane, and better. But I believe that that is the devil's ploy. 
So when, when you do you, it's all about you. See? God's plan is when you shout to the Lord, when you serve the Lord with joy, when you come before Him with singing, only then will you find peace, happiness, and a better life. If you would allow me to even narrow it down some more, I suggest that we focus on verse 2. First part, serve the Lord with joy. In order to find real joy, we have to serve. It's not the other way around. We don't serve because we have joy. We get joy because we've chosen to serve. You with me? That's a different attitude. That's a whole different approach when it comes to service. When you're serving so that you will be happy, so that you will be blessed, so that you will have joy in your heart, so that you would be a better person, you're serving from a wrong place. I'm sorry. I, I told you this was hard for me. I told you this was challenging. It got real quiet here. Because many of us do serve as if that is what would qualify us from receiving joy and blessing from God. Well, I'm here today feeling corrected and accepting this correction to say we serve because we already have the joy of God in our hearts. Unless we serve with joy, don't serve. I know this is really challenging to say because we in this church need your service. We in this church need everybody's talents and gift that God has given you. I mean, look at how our service today even was. The experience becomes wholesome, becomes a glorifying God experience when we give of our gifts. But if you don't have joy in giving of your gifts, that joy is not there. That service is not well received. So here's three dangers to watch out when serving. Let me share with you. These are common pitfalls that hinders Christians from serving with delight. This is when you do you. Number one, you're not sure what joy really means. You're not sure what delight really looks like. And because we do not know what delight really means when we think we are having or enjoying or having a great time, even that delight is substandard. That delight is not Real joy, it simply is some kind of happiness. Now, have you actually paused for a minute to find out the difference between joy and happiness? Aside from the spelling. You know, I hang out with, with smart students. They correct me every time, even if it's just spelling. But the real difference between joy and happiness is that with happenings, it's always based Happiness is always based on happenings. When the happening is good, I feel happy. When the happening is going well, there's happiness in my life. But when the happenings are going south, not the way we'd like it to be, I'm no longer happy. But when you have real joy, the kind of joy that only God puts in your heart, the joy that only God can provide that you will receive through serving, regardless of what's happening, you will still have joy. Have you ever wondered why people who don't have much, who are, are, are going through some major challenges in their life, are still able to smile and praise God? It's because they are not based on happenings. They are based on real joy that comes from God in their heart. What is your heart of joy looking like lately? Sometimes we are led to believe that as long as we are serving, we delight in what we're doing, that the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and soul, must be the real sign of our extreme happiness in serving. But this is still a substandard result of our own, own efforts. Are you counting the cost? Or are we like Paul when he said in Philippians 3.8, not only do these things matter, but I think that all things are worth nothing compared with the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of Him, I have lost all those things, and now I know they are worthless trash. These allow me to have Christ. Meaning, you can have everything you've ever wanted, but unless that joy in your heart exists, you will never be happy. But you can have nothing at all compared to everybody else. But when you have joy in your heart, nothing can stop you from praising God. There's a huge difference 
in that posture, in that attitude, in that way of character of serving. Number two, our delight is for the wrong purpose. Have you caught yourself making a big ugh sound when you remember you have to do something that's along the lines of serving or you really don't want to do it anymore, but since you already signed up for it, you go, ugh, I guess I have to go serve. I have to go sing. I have to go play. I have to do greetings, welcome, and all these kind of, ugh, I might as well. Or do we serve because we fear, we fear that we're going to be judged by peers? Or feel like it is an obligation that we have to do? Or have you caught yourself sometimes coming up with all creative excuses? And, and mind you, my excuses get real creative. It really gets real creative. I surprise myself sometimes. I'm like, wow, that's almost convincing. That was actually a good excuse. But then when I go and serve, I go, ugh. And some people are even good at that expression. They roll their eyes along with it. Have you not? Ugh. And the thing is, when we come up with all these excuses and serve anyway, the purpose of that service is at the wrong place. And so we leave that moment of serving still so empty, still feeling as if something is lacking in our heart. And it's because it's filled with happiness, but not with real joy. Where is your heart right now? When we serve God, whether by preaching up front or giving bulletins, or welcoming everyone who comes in our church doors, or serving in capacities that nobody even know you're serving in. Being in committees, being in teams, in programs, time to time, I think we need a reminder that God does not really need us. Remember that? Do you know that? God does not need us. Because my Bible says, if we don't sing His praise, He will make the rocks sing. He will make the rocks preach. He will make the rocks show the kind of love that Jesus is all about. And I'm looking out here and there's a lot of rocks. And if we don't serve from a heart of willingness, these rocks are going to take our place. See, I think we forget that God never needed us to move His kingdom forward on this earth. And yet, oh man. This is where it's so powerful. And yet, God knowing this broken vessel, He still says, Mark, I need you. I want you. I would like for you to serve. And yet, He still calls us, the broken vessels, to be the ones that move His kingdom forward. What an amazing God. He never needed us, but He's called us. What the Lord is really doing is giving us the opportunity to experience the blessing and joy in serving. He is looking for our obedience. Obedience is a very specific term. It does not mean work. It means putting your heart into something wholeheartedly. Number three, our love to serve is greater than our love for God sometimes. Lord have mercy. I've seen volunteers serving with delight, giving it all they got. I remember a co-pastor of mine who I considered a true servant leader of a shepherd. His name is John Wagner. Here's a guy more than twice my age with tons of extensions after his name, Doctor. You with me? There's, there's just letters that keep adding after his name. And here's a guy who's served as president of multiple universities and institutions and even community um, um, programs and committees. And, and he's been involved and is just renowned and is an accomplished person. One day, on a muggy summer Sabbath afternoon after potluck, this man was soaking wet. His dress shirt, he took his coat off, but his dress shirt was soaking wet. He had folded his sleeves and he just put behind him a large trash bag on his way to throwing it out at a bin. And I said, Dr. John, why are you doing this? There's several of us who can do this. Of course, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, you're probably stronger than me right now. Or <laughs> I'm glad you're the one carrying that. But, but I said, Dr. John, why are you doing this? He immediately looks at me and says, Mark, this is simply where I find joy in serving my Jesus. Man, that made a huge impact in my heart. There is nothing that we can do that is too low or too high when we are coming from a place of serving. There is nothing that we're too good, that we're too dressed up. I mean, I'm telling you, all these excuses that come up, too busy, 
too short to do. All of these become excuses when we have a heart not willing to serve from a place of Jesus' love. I was forever changed. When we think we are too high, mighty, powerful, and prestigious enough, we can no longer serve in levels of serving. We have become lovers of service more than lovers of the God we're serving. Sometimes we are so full of ourselves that we forget that we are giving glory to God and not pleasing our egos. And the people around us who, who continue to just support us because that's all we allow to be around us. Stay humble at all times because while the Lord appreciates your effort, He is also checking your heart. As I listed three dangers in serving the wrong way, I wish to finish with also sharing three points that cultivate true joy in serving. This is when we do we. According to Psalm 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desire of your heart. He is the one that gives you. Not as a result of what you do. It is when service is a you and God effort that true joy in service begins to happen. If we're being true to ourselves, we doubt if this verse is even true sometimes. We even arrive at those times when we try to count the amount of years, things, time, energy, finance, efforts we've offered in service. And as we count what we've done all this time, and unfortunately sometimes we feel like we are not appreciated, we are not valued, or we are not seen in our times of serving, and worse yet, we no longer find joy in our serving. If this is you today, perhaps we have missed the whole point of this passage. Because if we truly have the heart of serving, when we serve, there is delight. There is no counting. Oh man, I wish these people would go home already so I could close these doors. Man, I wish people would not just put too many trash and pick up their bulletins so I don't have to clean up before the next people will join. There's so much things that we begin to count when we're not coming from a heart of joy in service. So number one. We will remember that taking joy in service means our hearts find fulfillment first in God, not in what we do, not in what we've served, not in what we've done, not in how much time, money, energy that we've spent, but finding peace in acknowledging that the source of our joy is God, the anchor and provider of our life. Number two, when we draw our joy from Jesus versus what we do in serving, our goals, ambitions, purpose in life, priorities, and dreams align with His. And when it aligns with His, what happens is there's nothing that can be compared to the kind of joy that God gives you, provides in your heart, in your service. Three, when service is a we versus a me, is an us versus an I, you end up doing a we. Humans begin to see that all we really need is Jesus. Song said that. The worship team sang that. But I think we sing this song sometimes, but it never translates to the way we relate to others. Knowing these truths, what adjustments do we need to make in ourselves, in our priorities, in our attitudes to improve our delight in serving? I love what Mady's, our young adult leader, has shared at one of our young adult gatherings. She said, if you're at a place in your life where you need to be served, then you are welcomed here at Minnetonka Church. I loved it. And then she goes to say, but if you are also at a place where God has called you to serve, this is also the place to be because your urging, your calling is what we need in this place. And so this place is a place of refuge for those who need to be served, but this place is also a place where we thrive by serving others. Where initially this whole thing was started from you do you into you do we, I'd like to challenge us even further and say, how about we serve God, period? How about in everything we do is from a heart of to the glory of God? How about that? When we serve God, when we serve all, and as you and I take on this challenge, I can see that our hearts transform into waiting to be appreciated, recognized, and, 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 and just be called as the best one and awesome one to, I don't even give a care on how you look at me as long as I get to serve you. May we take this challenge now 
as a way of saying, okay, Lord, change my heart and lead me to where you would love me to serve. And the difference of our lives and the blessings that we become in this congregation, in this community, in this family, becomes a way where we are as one, blessed, united, and having real joy in our hearts. Can you just imagine what our experience is like when each and every one has that kind of joy in our hearts? Can you just imagine the kind of atmosphere, environment that our church community becomes when we come from a place filled with joy? So, friends, step up. Serve God. Serve His people. Serve His community. And my prayer is by doing the you do we, your heart, your life starts overflowing with Jesus' joy. That's what unity is all about. And when we operate in that kind of unity, I say, yay God. And because we say, yea, God, I pray that the Lord bless you, is my prayer in Jesus' name.